Welcome to Old Guy Tech, the OGT.TV recording studio. Technology for the rest of us. 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 Hi, thanks for coming. This is Rob with Old Guy Tech TV, and with me today I have a very, very good friend of mine, uh, Richard Karst, who I went to high school with, and we did uh, we did a lot of really crazy stuff together and had a wonderful time, and and uh, we're finding a good opportunity to talk to each other and see each other we haven't seen each other in a long time but you know what you make that bond as a as a friend in high school as tight as we are that bond is always there so it's really good to see you richard and oh, but, but, you know by the way if i make a mistake gotta remember i grew up with you and known as dick <laughs> okay so so if i slip up it's it's uh it's simply because uh you know i went back a few years in time but uh well, that's fine there are a lot of people that still call me dick my family all calls me dick oh okay good good well i know you like richard and so i'm going to try to stick to that and i understand it's just like me i like rob i don't like being called robert so that was somebody else i don't know yeah anytime when i was a kid anytime i heard the word robert i was in trouble <laughs> so <laughs> So we kept it for me when I heard Richard, especially coming from my mother. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, isn't that funny? And then if the middle name came out as well, that was it. I was really cooked. <laughs> so, uh -oh. but uh, time to run, yeah, absolutely. It's great. Well, anyway, it's really, really neat to be able to see you, and I really appreciate you coming and joining, uh, joining us with this uh, this new venture that we're getting into. And uh, Skype's going to be one of the big friends. Yeah, Skype's going to be one of the big things that we're going to do because we can't get everybody together. And really, what I'm hoping, and you and I kind of talked about it, is trying to get the old gang together and uh, maybe do this. And and uh, that would be neat, you know, maybe maybe Ryan Vessa and, and Bruce Brode and who knows, maybe your brother. I don't I don't know. We'll never know. But one of these days, we'll, we'll look at that. But uh, on the tech side today, one of the things that I'm doing with old, te uh, old Guy Tech is that I'm trying to bring technology to us almost 60-year-old guys and gals that are out there and, and talk a little bit about technology in different areas. I mean, we're going everywhere. We've been doing tech from cooking to guns to you name it, cars. We've got a, a new thing that we're starting to roll into. It's a school that wants us to come into our studio and use it for showing how to cook food and do things. So we've got a lot of things happening. So you've got a huge, huge resume of, of musical background that, uh, that's that gone beyond. And I, I'm proud to say that we were in a couple of bands together and had a great time. Why don't you give me a little history about what's going on now with you? Oh, well, what's going on now? Mostly I'm a, well, pretty much all the time I'm a freelance recording engineer and record producer and musician. I've got a couple of main clients I work for. It's mostly doing all devotional music huh? and um, playing, in a couple, playing in a couple of bands. Um, I started playing drum set recently, which has really been fun. Necessity is the mother of invention. Oh, yeah. And, uh, oh, yeah. Playing in the studio, I couldn't always find a good drummer, so I wound up just playing the drums myself. I started out just playing one drum at a time, but eventually I put it all together and I can hold down a pretty good groove. And last February, I started playing drums in a reggae rock band here in Santa Cruz called Love Eternal. Oh, how cool is that? And, and, uh, I love playing reggae music. It's It's got such a great feel. Oh, yeah. It's a lot of fun. A lot of fun. So yeah. that's been fun. And uh, I've been playing flute and um, tablas, a lot of tablas, the classical North Indian hand percussion, yeah. hand drum, yeah. uh, you know, Zakir Hussain uh, is a noted uh, tabla player. I've been playing tablas and flute in um, Mystic Troubadours, Wow. and we've been playing a few gigs and also playing for some yoga classes, which seems to be a new phenomenon happening all over the country and the world, is having live music at yoga classes, and it's really been fun. Oh, so I yeah. I cut my chops and... I can pretty much play whatever I feel as long as it's, as it's not too distracting. Right. It's been really fun. Oh, that is way cool. And that's the live performance side. As far as recording, I've been doing a lot of different projects. As I say, mostly devotional music, some children's music uh, in the past. Um, in the 80s and 90s, I traveled a lot with uh, a very well-known children's musician named Linda Arnold, who was recording on A&M Records. We flew all over the country, and I played bass with her. and. Wore the Tyrone the Dinosaur suit, Tyronosaurus Rex, <laughs> mm. Mm. and uh, that was really fun. One of my best memories, if we can get a little to the side here. Sure, absolutely. We um, we played some shows in Ventura, California, at the high school auditorium there, and um, show after show, we did I think five or six shows that day, and they bust in 
all these first graders for all the different shows. And Linda has this one song called Popcorn. We're in the chorus. The chorus goes pop, 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 pop. And we had a thousand first graders all jumping up and down in their seats because that's what you do. When, when the popping happens, she has the kids all jumping up and down. They brought up the house lights. And I'll never forget that image of a thousand first graders all jumping up and down in their seats the first time. It's one of the most wonderful things I've done in my life. Oh, I bet. I Just bet. fantastic. How great is that? And I've been very, I've been fortunate to work with some, some really well known people. Um, I got to produce a recording of classical North Indian music in around 1985 with a fellow named Amrit Gajar, who you probably haven't heard of, but I know you've heard him play because he played Dil Ruba on the Sgt. Pepper track, Within You, Without You. Uh, that wow. sort of bowed sitar sound. Yeah. That was played by Amrit Gajar, and uh, he was an engineer at the BBC in London in the 60s. He came out to Sunnyvale was working as a software engineer, but he was still playing music, and we connected working on this project. He huh. still had the same Dil Ruba he played on Sgt. Pepper. Wow. He had it with him, and he let me play it. Wow. Whoa. <laughs> I have actually held that instrument in my hand. That is cool. If you hear on that track. How about that? Small world That's sometime cool. when that stuff like that happens, yeah. isn't it? It's incredible. And there have been a lot of cool things. I studied a little bit of classic North Indian music under Ali Akbar Khan when he began teaching at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, I was the recording technician for the music department at UC Santa Cruz for 13 years. And that's how I got to meet him. And also how I met Zakir Hussain, who was here for a week. And I recorded every note he played. It was really fun. Wow. So, um, well, I'm just kind of rambling here about my past. I can no, go on no, that's, and on. That's but. what it's all about, man. It's 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 just you know talking about you know what you got going, what's going on. Let's you know we'll do your past. We'll get the present. That's no yeah. no big deal. You know, it's funny how you you go back to certain memories, and and I've got some very fond memories of you. And and uh, when when we were in school together, I remember um, you were the one that actually taught me how to play guitar. And uh, really? yeah, you, you taught you taught me to play. I don't know. I think we did ten, twelve chords. You got me doing chords, and then when we were doing the singing. You'd yell at me the chord to play. And I would play the chord, <laughs> you know. And so uh, that's one of those fond memories. I remember that quite well. That was always a lot of fun. And then I have another. See if you remember this memory. We did Christmas caroling. We did the brass group. We went around the different yeah. n neighborhoods and did that. Do you remember that? I sure do. Was that that's a blast or what? Fun. Yeah, I think Bruce Bruce Broad had taken all those arrangements out of old church hymnals that he'd found. He just transcribed all the four-part harmony, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, and transcribed it for, trump, for trumpet, French horn, trombone, and baritone horn, I think. Yeah, I believe that's right, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know, it's those little fond memories that you have of things like yeah. that, yeah, <laughs> that, I, that I look back and say, geez, that was, that was sure great times. We really had a good time doing that, so... And unfortunately for me, I have not kept up on the musical side. You know, I, I got so busy with life and everything else that just kind of got pushed back by everything else. But you know. well, you know, Rob, it's like riding a bicycle. You never really forget. Yeah, yeah. You take out the trombone, and if you just blew some of the rust out of the slide, you'd be playing it again in a day or two. I guarantee it. Yeah, well, maybe so. I, you know, it's not like I don't. I haven't. I got a beautiful bench sitting sitting here. Uh, you know, bass, and it's just, I, I just. With everything that's been going on, it's really hard to do. But I, I keep saying one of these days we're going to do it. And remember when the band reunion was coming up a number of years ago, uh, the big band reunion where we tried to get all, all class to go to it. I was, you know, I was all geared up to do that, and I got the horn out and I got ready. And then unfortunately, a family situation happened and I couldn't make it. So, oh yeah, but, I did miss you there. I made it there. I was that was a stairway to the stairway of the stars, wasn't it? You know. I couldn't remember. I just thought it was like an old class band reunion, and I I don't know what years it came into, but I know it was our years and uh, some of the others, and and uh, and then of course if if we played at SMC too, so that was fun. Right. Yeah, that was that was really good times. As honorary members. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That was pretty fun. That was pretty cool. So Lake Havasu, London Bridge. Yeah. We we marched across London Bridge at the official dedication after they'd flown it from London stone by stone to Lake Havasu and we were among the first people to walk across it after it was completed. That was pretty cool. Mazatlan was the big 
was the other big memory for me on that is the trip to Mazatlan. Mazatlan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was that sure brings it. That was a whole interview right there. Oh, I, I think we would get in trouble if we actually said, <laughs> said everything that we did. <laughs> it's better off not known. <laughs> It's yeah. really good. I think, I think you're probably right. Yeah, that. yeah. We'll we'll talk we on the phone. We were young and crazy. We were young and crazy, and we'll we talk on the phone with the. We're all minors. Yes, <laughs> we're all minors. That's right. You can't come back and get us now. <laughs> but it was fun. We had some great memories. So anyway, with that said, um, let's let's talk about a little bit about some of the equipment that you use in your uh, your everyday life and your recording, uh, you know, your studio and what you use and what you mix with and the mics and all that neat stuff that you got going. Oh, did I lose you? Well, let's see. Where shall I begin? Oh, uh, <laughs> that no, was I'm a... still here. I'm just thinking about it. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> D dead air, uh, you know, dead air on me. Well, I'm old school. I started. Uh, oh, that's why we have editors. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, take two. <laughs> <laughs> well, I started out old school. I was. Uh, I, I learned how to do recording with analog tape, where you start with a big reel on the left and finish up with a small reel on the right, and um, cutting and editing and overdubbing. I uh, learned how to do it on a reel-to-reel four-track, and um, then graduated to um, start working with 16-track, got a job in a recording studio oh, in the mid-80s that had a two-inch 16-track, and what I mean by two-inch, that's the width of the tape, Right, right. where a cassette tape is an eighth of an inch yep, yep. in, in right. width, and the, um, let's see, a regular reel-to-reel, -reel, what most people see is a quarter-inch, there is half-inch tape which is what most of the consumer, the prosumer 16-track machines were. Right. Uh, half inch. But the pro machines were all one inch and two inches wide. That's a piece of tape that's that wide. Oh, yeah. And um, the, the resolution on that, the sound quality, is phenomenally great. It's just really, really good. And when I started working in that studio, I knew that I wanted to do that for the rest of my life, was make recordings. So I did wind up getting my own analog 16-track machine, but at that point, this is in the 1990s, and digital recording was coming around. Right. Everybody went from analog recording to digital first with these, still using magnetic tape on a machine invented by a company called Alesis, which is called an ADAT, which is short for Alesis Digital Audio Tape. And the tape that they used was just a standard VHS videotape which made the recording media really, really inexpensive, very affordable. Right. So once you got an ADAT recorder, you could do as much digital recording as you want, pretty much, because you could just go down and, you know, get, get an, well, each tape would only last about 16 minutes, but still, for like three or four bucks or five bucks for 16 minutes of recording time, that's really good. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, so and, we all used ADATs, and you can use, more, you can get more than one of them. Um, one ADAT had eight tracks, and you could synchronize, I think, up to eight of them to get a total of, uh, or no, you could synchronize up to 16 of them to get a total of up to 128 tracks. At wow. Once. Wow, but that's that incredible. That's really cumbersome because you have to have all the machines synchronizing with each other every right. time you start and stop. And then we started doing it on the computer. We started not using the, the tape at all, but we started recording to hard disk, which was quite cumbersome at first because of issues like bandwidth and uh, just the platter speed on, on a hard disk. It would take a long time to write all the data. But as technology has gotten faster and faster and as we observe Moore's Law, continuing to hold true and Moore's right. law for computing states that every 18 months processing power will double. double right and I think that also holds true for the storage media so we've got to a point actually about 10 years ago we got to a point where it really was efficient to use a computer instead of analog or, or digital tape so magnetic tape is pretty much gone we don't use it really anymore unless right. you're at a very very high end studio that still uses all the analog gear which still right. is the best sound analog mm -hmm. does sound better than digital yes those with ears know well you know it's the old vinyl um, so now we're using a computer um like what i oh yeah the old vinyl i love vinyl vinyl is dead. 
So like back here, I've got, um, I have a project up here in uh, Digital Performer, which is a digital audio workstation. So this is one of my songs. Got the mixing board down here on the bottom. I don't know if you can see all this very clearly in the video, but yeah, unfortunately yeah. we're getting we're getting a lot of uh, freeze freeze frame, but we're getting your audio, so that's the important okay. part. Yeah. So so it's got a, a digital mixing board and a digital pieces of tape. That, just like a word processor, you can actually pick up pieces of tracks and move them around. Right. Uh, you can copy either a word or an entire paragraph or an entire five pages with a word processor. And with a music processor like this, you can copy a note or an entire track of, say, the entire trumpet track, or you can even copy several tracks all at once and move them and paste them wherever you want. So, say you record, a, you have a, a backup vocalist that sings the backup vocal on the chorus the first time really well, and the second time doesn't sing it so well. Oftentimes, you can copy and paste that first chorus and stick it in the second chorus. Right. Right. So that's pretty cool. Oh yeah, that's really neat. Same thing in the video video digital world that we've got. We can take, you know, we can pop out frames and put another one in or, or do whatever we need to do. So it's very similar as to what you're doing, what, what we're doing with the video. Yeah, so the way I do it, it, well, my approach really depends on what I'm recording. As I said earlier, I was the recording engineer for the music department at the University of California Santa Cruz for 13 years and I did a lot of all different kinds of recording everything from symphony orchestras and choral groups to uh, jazz bands avant-garde um, I actually did a project with Morton Sabotnik Rob remember him oh, we used to listen oh, yeah. to Morton Sabotnik when we were in high school oh, yeah. and uh, all the electronic music well he came through UC Santa Cruz and I did a show with him <laughs> He's a really nice guy. Oh. Um, so I've done all kinds of things. And um, a lot of times it's easier just to set up a couple mics and stand back and just let the music happen. Right. Sometimes you want to put up a whole forest of microphones and, and I want to get the guitar, I want to mic the bass drum, I want to mic the, the piano and, and get them all and then mix it all down later. So there are really different approaches. For pop music, I'll usually do the latter. Mm -hmm. For classical music, I'll usually do the former. Um, most of what I do tends to be pop music. And um, usually it's guitar, bass, drums, keyboards, vocals, verse, chorus, that kind of thing. Um, so what I'll start is I'll put down a click track, like a metronome. It'll be a guide to keep right. the tempo consistent throughout the entire song. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, instead of using a metronome, though, I produce a drum pattern. Like, instead of just click, 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 which is so relentless and cold, I'd rather have a drum machine play a drum pattern that's kind of groovy, like boom, boom, pattern, boom, boom, pattern, boom, boom, pattern. And I can really get into it on an emotional level while I'm playing along with it. Even right. though the time is still really rigid, it's still got a little bit of a feel to it. Right. Right. Yeah. So then after that, I'll put down maybe a scratch guitar, scratch bass. I'll try to play them well because I might wind up using them in the final mix. But at this point, I'm just trying to create a framework that I can play along with and have a pretty good groove happening. So I'll get the drum pattern and the guitar and the bass. And maybe if it's a complicated song, I might throw it on a scratch vocal, too, as a guide vocal. Yeah. Once I've got that in, then I'll go back and I'll replay the drums on a real drum set. That, that'll that have a little bit of human error in it, a little bit of slop. Right. Because you don't want it to be too perfect, because right. if it sounds really perfect... It sounds like a machine. It doesn't feel right. It right. sounds like a machine. Yeah, yeah. And, and the reason that a live drummer feels better is because he's not perfect, or she's not perfect. And uh, a good rock drummer will always tell you the, the backbeat, two and four, should be slightly late, but one and three should be right on the beat. And that's what gives it that feel, that the two and four is just, oh, just ever so slightly late. It just opens up the groove. You really notice this in, in some kinds of music, like reggae in particular. I come back to that again because it's such a deep groove that people don't understand. And the thing about reggae is that the time is so elastic, and yet it's so precise at the same time. Hmm. That's why a lot of people think they can play reggae, but they don't really have a good groove. Right. Yeah. Well, there's, there's I mean, te techniques to everything. Now. That's right. Yeah. You see these musicians, uh, well, it's just a really easy groove. It's just three chords, but 
they're completely missing the whole point of, yeah. of what reggae is all about. It's not about the complexity. It's about how deep the simplicity is. And so drumming is like that, being really late on two and four and being right on the beat on one and three. Now, if you start being late on one and three, you're dragging. Right, right. So that's yeah. how you get a good yeah. groove going in a rock band anyway. Well, that's kind of neat. And then I... once I have a take I like, then um, I might redo the bass and the guitar. And I'll... What's that? No, I was going to say I I, I I I haven't have a set I, I haven't set it up in a long time, but I've messed around with drums for a while too, so I know exactly what you're talking about, you know. So yeah, it's a great great feeling to play drums. Oh yeah, I can teach anybody to play drums in about five minutes. Oh yeah, I won't do that right. <laughs> no, 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 no. It, that's, that's okay. Uh, so no. I'll, I'll fill in all the other. <laughs> I'll fill in um, like the keyboard, the piano, organ. Maybe a string pad. A pad is when you're playing long tones that just fill in the background without really getting in the way. Uh -huh. Usually it's long notes that only change when the chord changes. That we call a pad in the recording studio. And uh, once I get a pretty good sounding rhythm track there, then it's time to start putting some vocals in. I might put in the, the lead vocal. I might put in the background vocals first. It really depends on the song and where I'm going with it. And then when all the tracks are recorded, then we mix it down. And there are some philosophies about mixing, too. I don't know how much you want to get into that today. I'd be happy to if you want. Sure, absolutely. Let's talk about it. Uh, okay, well, mixing is the process of taking all the recorded tracks. And by a track, I mean, like, say you've got a trumpet on one track, and then you've got a guitar on one track, and you have a singer on one track, and then drums might be recorded on anywhere from four to eight tracks. Like You have the bass drum on one track and the snare drum on one track. Mixing is the process of taking all these different tracks and blending them together in such a way that it sounds really good and all the sounds are balanced, and then mixing that down to stereo, like the left channel and the right channel, so that somebody can take it home and play it on their CD player and listen on the stereo. That's what the process of mixing is in a nutshell. Now, the tools we use to do that are many and varied. Um, one of the most principal tools that we use would be the equalizer and everybody that's played with a stereo has worked with an equalizer whether they know it or not because the the bass and treble controls on your stereo those are equalizer controls but every stereo that's got bass and treble actually has three bands of equalization it has bass and treble and it has mid-range too but you don't really realize that because there isn't a mid-range control how do you find the mid-range well when I'm mixing when I'm dialing in somebody's stereo, somebody might ask me, make my stereo sound good, Richard. The first thing I do is I turn the bass and the treble all the way off. Then what's left is the mid-range, and I control that with the volume control. Set that to a good level. Then I'll add the bass until it sounds nice and full, but not overwhelming. Most people add too much bass. And then lastly, I'll turn up the treble until it sounds bright and crisp, but not at all shrill. Generally, at that point, the stereo is going to sound really good, no matter what you play on it. Right. right. And what I've done is I've just done equalization on a stereo system. Yep. Now, in the recording studio, we have more than those three bands. We can have up to 10, 12, well, really as many bands as we want. And we subdivide them into much narrower ranges, rather than something as wide as everything below the middle for the bass and everything above the middle for the treble. We'll actually use numbers for frequencies. Um, and the equalizers go from pretty much the range of human hearing, which is for most people roughly 20 cycles per second to 20,000 cycles per second, with 1,000 cycles per second being about in the middle, because it's, it's not linear, it's logarithmic. Every time that you double the frequency, you go an octave higher. So C at 256 cycles per second, that's middle C. An octave above that is 512 cycles per second. And we use these numbers when we're doing equalization. If I'm hearing kind of a bright shrillness at a certain note, I can look on the chart and see what frequency that is. And then I can just duck that frequency. By duck, I mean by pulling down the amount of frequency that's present in the signal right. with the equalizer. Right. Yeah. And if something is lacking, you can also boost. But I tend to cut rather than boost because boosting tends to raise the level more than cutting does. 
So that's a, a quick discussion of equalizers. Now, a very frequently used and probably the most misunder misunderstood tool in the recording studio is the compressor. And a limiter is a form of a compressor. Now, what a compressor does is it reduces the dynamic range. And what I mean by dynamic range is the difference between loudness and softness. Um, humans can hear a very wide dynamic range. We can hear a pin drop at about 30, 20, 30 decibels, and we can withstand being on the tarmac where a jet plane is landing, which is about 120 decibels. And again, the decibel meter is logarithmic. Every increase of 10 decibels is an increase of 10 times in volume. Right. Therefore, an increase of 20 decibels is an increase of 100. Right, right, yep. So... Um, most recording media can't deal with that wide range. And it, it kind of brings around a funny point. Um, at the beginning of recording, the goal was to try to get to capture as much dynamic range as we could. And what was available was on the low end, we had the noise floor. How much noise is present in the recording before you even start recording anything? Right. And a good example of that is say you go to the store and buy a brand new cassette tape and don't record anything on it, put it in your cassette player and turn the volume all the way up and that hiss you hear, that's the noise floor. That's right. the noise that's just inherent on the tape, right. even before you put anything on it. Right, exactly. Now the distortion ceiling is how much signal you can saturate that tape with before distortion sets in. And um, a good analogy for that is to have a dry sponge, and you're trying to fill that sponge with as much water as you can, but you don't want a single drop to spill out. And when you saturated that sponge with as much water as it can hold, then you filled up the sponge. And recording to analog tape is the same kind of thing. You want to saturate the tape with a magnetic signal, as much signal as it can take, without any spillage. Because once it starts to spill, then you get distortion, and you get that really horrible sound. Right. right. So... That's the dynamic range. Now, recording symphony orchestras in the 50s was really a challenge because you'd have a passage that's really, really quiet, and then all of a sudden the trumpets and trombones will start shouting and the timpani will start pounding and it just gets really, really loud. And while they're recording, they'd actually have to have somebody in the, the lathe cutting room that would adjust the volume while they were playing to adjust the width of the grooves on the, on the record. Right. And if the guy made a mistake, you blew it. The symphony orchestra has to stop, and they go back to the beginning, and they start all over again. <laughs> so somebody figured out that if they put a compressor after the microphone and before either the recorder or the lathe cutting machine, they could reduce the difference between quiet and loud and make the lathe cutting guy's job a lot easier. And so we started using compressors in the recording. And pretty soon, people figured out that not only did it make it technically easier for the lathe cutter, it also made the vocals sound better. Because you could still belt it out, and the compressor would hold back the level, but you'd still get all the presence and the energy sure. of belting it out. Right, and right. you could sort of come back and, and sing really soft, but the compressor would bring the level up so it wouldn't drop away. And it made it a lot easier to mix. So we use compressors almost all the time now right, in the studio. Right. I always add a little bit of compression when I'm recording a vocal or, say, a trumpet or a saxophone or bass guitar. I always compress bass guitar when I record it. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. In in, in analogy for, for those that aren't technical out there, um, your television that you're watching, when you're watching a television show, uh, that audio is very compressed. Uh, yes. So that you don't have to keep turning the volume up and down, it, you know, it stays the same. And one of the reasons they noticed that, boy, that commercial was sure loud. Well, yeah, guess what? It's actually at a lot older level than your TV show. So in essence, that's what they're, they're compressing that. So that's how us old guys can relate to what you're what you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. Now the commercials on TV aren't actually any louder, but they seem to be louder because the signal stays at the peak much longer than the signal of the movie that you're watching late at night and not trying to disturb your neighbors with. You know, it's interesting. <laughs> There's a whole deal in Congress. I don't know if you read it. I don't have the article with me now. But uh, apparently there's some congressman somewhere It's so pissed at the fact that, that it assumes, he assumes, 
that the commercial really is louder. And I'm with you on that because I, I know technically how it works. And they're actually trying to pass a bill to, to, to make sure that commercials are not louder than the movies that you're watching. Just amazing. But anyway, sorry, that's a, that's a side note <laughs> well, that I found. Uh, no, transmitters all have... <laughs> that's, 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 that's an example of completely unnecessary uh, legislation because all the transmitters all across the country have brick wall limiters as the last thing. Yep. So there's no way that the signal can get louder than that. What a brick wall limiter is, is a compressor that puts a ceiling on that so hard it's like running into a brick wall. Once you get to that level, it won't get any louder. No right. matter how much you turn up the game, it's not getting any louder. That's a brick wall limiter, and all transmitters have them. Yeah. Just to protect the yeah. transmitter so they don't blow them up. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of power absolutely. there. I mean, you know, like 50,000 watts cage. <laughs> yeah, it makes you glow yeah. if you get too close. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think a lot, a lot of people don't really quite understand that, which is why I take the time to point it out. Oh, yeah, it was funny. But well, that's yeah, what... so mixing. So that's what it comes that's what a compressor does. And then um, we also use um, what we call reverb, which is reverberation. Um, and if you've walked into a gymnasium or a big cave and you've heard the reverberant echo, then you know what I'm talking about. Now, reverb and echo are actually different things. The difference is with echo, you can hear discrete, disparate reflections. Hello, 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 hello. That's an echo. But if it all smears together, like if you're in a round cave where all the reflections come back at very different times, all staggered, and it all blends together and blurs, that's reverb. Hello! Right. right. And usually when we record in the studio, we record things without any echo or reverb, and we add that later after the fact. Yeah, it makes sense. And there are a lot of ways to do that. I could spend the whole day about reverb. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure we could spend hours There's on There's a every... new technology called convolution reverb where you can walk into a reverberant space. You could walk into a, rever a reverberant space and play a sine wave or on a speaker or fire off a starting pistol like they use on in track and make a recording of that and go back to the computer with an algorithm. You can subtract the stimulus signal, and what's left behind is just what they call an impulse response. And what this means is that you can go into any place in the world to make a recording, and then bring that back in your studio and put your lead singer in that space. That's like, pretty I cool. Have, um, an impulse response of Disney Hall in Los Angeles. I have. Um, the Sydney Opera House in, in Sydney, Australia, which actually doesn't sound very good, but it's a beautiful building. Yeah. Isn't that funny? <laughs> and uh, I've got Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, a bunch of things. That's really so good. Should we talk about kind of some microphones? Hey, you know what? Let's talk microphones. Sounds good. I know you've got some something really cool and hot coming up you were showing me. Let's, right. let's do that. Okay, well, there are really four kinds of microphones I can think of. Um, I'm going to show you three of them. Um, there's dynamic microphones, condenser, ribbon, and then the fourth kind is PZM, sometimes called piezo. And I don't really have anything I can show you other than pickups on a guitar. Like you can see this bass behind me over here. This is actually an electric acoustic instrument. And it has piezo microphones in the bridge here. But I can't really show them to you because they're embedded in the bridge. Right. They're essentially contact microphones. We're seeing a lot of use of those in uh, electric acoustic instruments. So so those are piezo mics. I'm not really going to say anything more about them. Right. And then we have dynamic mics. And this is the first kind of microphone. This is probably the most famous dynamic microphone in the world. It's made by the Shure Corporation. It's called an SM58. Every sound engineer in the world knows what to do with this. If you've ever been on a stage, you've probably held one of these in your hand. Oh, yeah. This is a dynamic microphone, and that means that there's an element inside here that actually responds physically to my voice and moves back and forth. It's a magnet suspended 
on some kind of a spring or something, and it moves back and forth inside other magnets and creates electrical signal that way. Because as you probably know, or maybe you don't know, if you have if you move a magnet inside a coil, or if you move it inside another magnet, it will generate an electric current. And that's what generates the sound, which then gets amplified and either recorded or sent out over a PA system. And here's another dynamic mic. This is um, also made by the Shure Corporation. This is an SM57, which is essentially the same thing as this, except it doesn't have the ball on it. These are probably the two most widely used microphones in the world. Now, for broadcast um, AM radio, and uh, if you've ever seen a, a radio show where the, the host is also on TV, he's probably been talking on one of these. This is an Electro Voice RE20, and this is something of an industry standard for for uh, radio talk show hosts. You know, you see our, our local sports guys on KNBR using these, and some of our um, political talk show hosts use these too. And, um, okay, so those are dynamic mics. Now, there's another kind of microphone called a condenser mic, which has an electrostatically charged disc inside it. Here's a really good example of this. This is a microphone made by AKG. I don't know if I, if I get really close, I don't know if you can actually see the disc inside. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've got that backlight. You can see that disc inside the oh, yeah. microphone the Absolutely. circle behind the grill. That's yep. the condenser element itself, and it's electrostatically charged. There are two plates, and when I talk into this microphone, the distance between the, the plates, um, I, gu I guess that's how it works. I'm not actually really <laughs> sure, but I think that's how it works. <laughs> Um, the plates will move closer and further apart from the vibration that'll generate the signal. Now these microphones are extremely sensitive. The dynamic microphone is really not so sensitive. This is extraordinarily sensitive. So it'll pick up the high end really, really well, like if you're going to record an acoustic guitar or a harp or something like that. But it's also really se sensitive to somebody dropping a pencil in the back. Of right. It. Yeah, yeah. This is a large element. That, this is the mic I've got up here in the frame. Here, these are the same microphone, the AKG 414. Right. Yeah. This is a very, very popular microphone. Yeah. yeah. And here is an AKG 451. This is what some people call pencil condensers because they're so thin. And this is a very nice microphone too, the element being inside here. You can see the diameter is much smaller. And obviously the uh, condenser is much smaller. What this does is it makes it more sensitive to higher frequencies. It doesn't pick up the lows quite as well. And then there's another microphone, a ribbon microphone. I've got two examples of this. This is, again, this is a, a Sure Brothers product. This is the, there's this, this is the Unitron. Um, what is this? It's a 330. The Unitron 330. I had to look at the side of the box. This is popularly known as the Johnny Carson mic because he had this mic on his desk for a lot of years and it's a night show. You recognize it? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and ribbon microphones are also very sensitive. But um, unlike condenser microphones, which tend to accentuate the high end, ribbon microphones tend to pick up more of the lows and mid-range, the low mid-range, and they tend to be very warm and full sounding. And there is quite literally a ribbon that's stretched across this area and as the ribbon vibrates, it generates an electrical signal, which is picked up and amplified. Now, ribbons are very fragile. You have to be very careful with them. Hmm. Condenser mics are fragile, too. Ribbon mics are even more so. Right. But there's a new thing that just came out. I'm very fortunate to have this here today. Um, this is pretty wild. It sounds pretty science fiction. Um, they say this is created in a laboratory. Some of the conspiracy theorists actually think this is reverse engineered technology oh. from the Roswell crash. I'm okay. not making this All right. <laughs> We can assume that it is. That's I'm fine. not willing yeah. to take a position on this myself. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's assume that anyway, there's this new material called Roswell and Roswellite has a really unique characteristic. Um, if you take a piece of tin foil and you crumple it up, it'll stay in that form. But if you take a sheet of Roswellite and crumple it up, crumple it up, it'll spring back to its original shape. So they've been using this in medicine to strengthen arterial walls and such like that. Right. Now, the people that were working with this and invented Roswellite in the lab or found it in the <laughs> desert of New Mexico, 
Um, they're also musicians, and they thought, what if we use Roswell light to make a ribbon microphone? Huh. And really, I'm not trying to sell sure products here. I use Neumann, I use Earthworks, I use all <laughs> kinds of different microphones, but this happens to be sure. And the reason that Sure has it is because they bought the technology from right. these people. So right. Sure, yeah. right now is the only worldwide distributor of microphones with Roswell Light technology. And what's really amazing about this is this is a fantastic sounding ribbon microphone, but it's not fragile. Oh, the excursion of a, of the ribbon it can go way out. I saw a video of it on YouTube where it was going out like oh almost a half an inch it looked like, and the ribbon wasn't breaking, and it can handle. SPLs, which stands for sound pressure level, of up to 147 decibels, which would sure Ooh. break your eardrum. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you're standing next to a, a well, jet on the tarmac, that's like 130. Yeah, decibels. exactly. I was going to say that's three times a, a jet engine sound. So, so yeah. Yeah. So, so that's really revolutionary. And we're actually auditioning this microphone right now. I think we've decided that we're going to buy it. It's, oh, my. it's pretty expensive. Oh, I my. I want to tell you how much. Oh, my. Yeah, I, I, I can... Yeah, but, it, I'll tell you what, Richard. There isn't a piece of technology that between you and I are sitting by right now that's cheap any longer. They're just it, you know, true. you know, if you get something, well, except we were talking about our Mackies, and our Mackies are, are are pretty reasonably priced. But you start getting into some of the rest of the stuff, you know, our, our cameras and everything are just it, it just takes a fortune. So it's yeah, it's pretty expensive. But one of the wonderful things about. Uh, the recording technology of the last 10, 15 years is how much the price has come down. In the 1970s, if you wanted to do a recording studio, you were looking at maybe seventy, a hundred thousand yeah. dollars startup, yeah. and that's in nineteen seventy-five dollars. Right. right. That's not even taking inflation into consideration. Oh yeah. Now, if you want to start a studio, two, three thousand, and that'll get you a really powerful computer, a great microphone. Nice uh, mic preamp with maybe a compressor limiter built into it, which I would recommend. And uh, some nice headphones. Maybe a little, yep. uh, small little mixer for signal routing. Yeah. And away you go. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It, it doesn't oh, have the to software, be... software, of course. Don't yeah. have to buy the software. Yeah, it, uh, the, the, adding the computers to the whole mix has helped quite a bit. There's no doubt about it. And, uh, of course, we do everything in our studios digital, yeah, 100%. Sure. And uh, the the tools that are out there on the computers, on the software, to be able to do the editing, it just keeps getting better and better and better. And uh, uh, that's kind of a nice. And, and you know, for people starting, also by the way, there's that's some amazing. there's a there's some shareware stuff that's out there on the net. Um, AB Video Converter is one that I can think of. It's just just amazing. It's free and it does an incredible job uh, of uh, of mixing. And uh, anyway, there's a lot of good stuff out there. Uh, but, uh, I'm also a little bit of a believer as you there get what is. you pay for, you know, <laughs> so if you go too cheap, you know, yeah, that's certainly true. Yeah. So you do get a little bit of what you yeah. pay for. We'll talk about the software. It seems there are really three main software packages that are out there right now. Most of the studios have pro tools, which was first marketed by DigiDesign, and then DigiDesign was bought by Avid, which is, a, I'm sure, a company you're familiar right. with, Rob. absolutely. And um, then there's Logic, which was bought by Apple Computer. Right. And the last digital logic workstation that has not been bought by a giant corporation is the one that I like to use, which is called Digital Performer. It's made by a company called Motu. It's still their own company. It's 22 employees in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I really like them. Um, but as far as the technical specs between Pro Tools and Logic and Digital Performer, or as we prefer to call it, DP, they all pretty much do the same thing. Um, you could argue that Pro Tools sounds better because of their proprietary hardware, but the truth is that, okay, you're spending $10,000 to get into their hardware that only works with their software, but you could also get something from Apogee. I'm talking about the analog to digital right. to analog converters, and that's... For those that don't know what that is, that's what takes the signal coming from the microphone and turns it into computer ones and zeros so the computer can relate to it and then turns it back into something we can listen to and plug into our stereo. Those are the analog digital ana analog converters, ADA converters. And there's a company called Apogee that makes really, really high quality ones that work very well with DP and they sound every bit as good as Pro Tools. And 
that's one of the reasons I like DP is because they play nice with everybody else. You can use their hardware. They make hardware and software. Right. You can right. use their hardware and their software with everybody else's stuff. They don't have any kind of proprietary restrictions. And that's nice. Some of the other companies do. Right. I also right. like it that they haven't been bought by a giant corporation, and I'm really into supporting the small business. Well, we got a small business uh, that's also and here in the United the States. people that really know, people at the really top of the game in the music business use Digital Performer. Like, for example, Danny Elfman, when he does a film score, he uses Digital Performer. Yeah. Partly because it's so easy to lock the picture, and partly because it's just so easy and fun to work with. Right, right. And um, well, you know, checking off some of the Logic and Pro Tools fans here, and I just want to say to those folks, you know, your software is really good too. Um, I'm old school. I I came from the analog world, and DP just works for me because it's so intuitive and it's got all the features that anything else has and I just love it and oh, just, yeah. it sounds great I totally understand what you mean I mean we, we all have our own favorite mixing yeah. uh, here in the studio uh, uh, I work with my son yeah. Jonathan you know and he's got his favorite editing tools I've got my favorite editing tools and uh, and so, yeah, I, I can understand exactly uh, what you're talking about. And it's nice that uh, that the uh, you're able to use multiple and different equipment with it. I mean, proprietary bothers me a little bit. Um, I, that's my. I also have a little problem with Apple yeah, products, but that's, that's not our. Well, yeah. You know, I. I, I, I mean, I, I both love and hate. For reasons. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Well, I, you know, I I I, I'm, I kind of yeah. like to get into uh, uh, technology. I'm, I'm I'm an early early inventor into it, and so it's like I've got a classic iPad that I absolutely love. I think it's probably one of the neatest things ever made. But I decided to buy uh, uh, when when HP came out with their HP Touch. Hell, you could pick up this tablet that did almost everything the iPad did for half the price. So I bought one just to use here in the studio. It's it's amazing. And then, of course, poor HP comes out and says they lasted uh, less than four months. And said, oh, we're done. It, it, you know, and that's kind of crazy. So <laughs> it's like, but uh, but I'm looking forward to the iPad 3 when it comes out. Because that, that sometime next year will be really something. And, and I'm really looking forward. But I love that. That's about the only real Apple. Well, I shouldn't say that. I have an iPod, like yeah, everybody I, else does. I skip the iPad. Yeah. Sure. Well, I, you know, so I have my iPod and I have my iPad, and then, but everything else is in my world. All my mixing stuff and all my other computer stuff is actually all PC based, and uh, my computers, uh, all the desktop stuff, I actually build myself. I don't. Uh, I think I can build a bigger, better machine for half the price that you'd buy if you went to Dell. No, oh, sure. If you yeah. know what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. You certainly can. So I've been doing a lot of that, but that's that's worked out really good. But uh, so there's definitely correlations between what uh, what you do and at a little higher end than what I'm doing. But we've got similar correlations. Our, our software, in some respects, is very similar. And uh, we, you know, you have to learn to use your tools. And um, we, that, that's one of the things I'm doing with this whole new studio. It's like I tell everybody, hey, hang in with me. Nothing's going to be 100% perfect. We're, we're still working the bugs out. It's kind of like the email I sent you yesterday. We had a problem. We fried a card, and it was like, oh, Lord. So we went, we had, because we had two shows that we had to do today. So we had to do some scrambling, but we managed to get it done anyway. But uh, we've been doing this for while, quite a while, and I know the attention span of the YouTube uh, uh, users is probably quite short, so we probably run a little bit longer this time than I normally would. But what I'd like to do is invite you back, and let's talk some more about uh, some of the stuff, uh, maybe, maybe more of uh, your actual music, what you're playing, where you're going, and that type of things, and as yeah. well as more of the technical, and just kind of catch up again. And I'd love to have you back. Uh, uh, hopefully you've had fun talking about this stuff with us. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to close with one really quick point, which is my philosophy of music. Music is a really powerful medium. It's very expressive, and a lot can be communicated. I think it's really important to utilize that medium to put out a positive message to make things better. Um, we listen to, like, punk and death metal and stuff like that and I just I get a feeling I just don't feel so good and uh, for that reason I think it's really important to to keep it really positive and and we can talk about this more next time but I think it's important to to put out a good message and so that's what my life is about is 
putting out a good message with music as the vehicle. Absolutely, and I can't agree with you anymore because music has been a big part of my life as well as yours, and uh, I don't know where we'd be without it. And, uh, you know, I, I've learned to broaden my horizons a little bit. I listen to some stuff that I normally wouldn't listen to every now and then, and it's kind of interesting, but I'm with you on that. I There's some music that uh, I don't think is positive, and uh, I believe in the... The positive feelings and what we can do with the music as well so i totally agree with you on that richard so hey you know what with that we're going to close this out i want to thank you very much for uh, uh coming and being with us today uh, i'm rob charney with old guy tech tv okay. and uh, we had richard Carter with us and we will talk again thanks Rich. We'll see. all right all right thank you we'll see you next time